Good morning. Welcome to the Friday morning plenary. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Bryan Street Memorial Award for Scholarship Bridging Anthropology, Education, and Literacy Practices presentation, the Bar Mosenthal presentation, the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award presentation, as well as this year's 2023 invited plenary keynote address by Dr. Donna Ford. Just a note, you should have received a message that this afternoon's plenary session has been canceled due to an unfortunate event uh, with Dr. Tyrone Howard's family. I ask that we keep him in our thoughts and prayers. At 445, instead, please come to our annual business meeting. And now it's time for the Bryan Street Memorial Award presentation. Please welcome Michiko Hakita, chair of the committee, who will announce the winner of the award. Good morning. Uh, I cannot say how excited I am to announce this year's inaugural award winner for the Bryan Street Memorial Award for scholarship bridging anthropology, education, and literacy practices. Uh, the work of this year's awardee so beautifully honors the work of uh, Bryan Street, and I know that he would be um, proud and honored that she is the recipient. So please join me in congratulating Dr. Lina Trigos Carrillo from the University Universidad del Norte in Colombia. Uh, thank you, Michiko, and congratulations, Lena. Now I would like to welcome Katina Zamet, sponsor of the 2019 Bar Mosenthal Award winner, to present the Bar Mosenthal Award uh, winner. Thank you. I'm presenting this award, uh, the Bar Mersenthal uh, Award, the Handbook of Reading Research Award, on behalf of Professor Laurie uh, Asaf, who's chair of the, uh, the committee. Just for your information, the Bar Mersenthal Award is funded by royalties generously donated over many years by editors and authors of the Handbook of Reading Research. It is, the award was created to promote and widen the understanding of literacy research in developing non-OECD countries. The award aims to build the capacity of literacy educators and the institutions in which they work to conduct, disseminate and increase the impact of literacy research. The expectation is that the award will focus on individuals and institutions to prepare and develop the expertise of their, of their teachers. The funds that are provided to assist in the organisation, books, computer hardware, software for data analysis, memberships in professional associations, uh, journal subscriptions, to build their understandings and their capacities of uh, literacy educators in non-OECD countries. An LRA member sponsors the International Literacy Educator, who they nominate, as I did in 2019, and support their work. As a sponsor, they know the applicant and are willing to act on LRA's behalf to support them and to help ensure that the activity is going to be conducted as agreed. Being a sponsor, and I encourage you all to consider this and put an application in for next year, being a sponsor for Bar Mosenthal Handbook of Reading Research Award recipient is a very rewarding and can help extend our support to international colleagues around the world. I still work with my international colleague, um, Carol Abiri-Leo, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and uh, we're doing some fantastic work in, the, in translanguaging trans with bilingual and multilingual um, reading uh, books for children in the primary years. This year's recipient for the award is Dr. Blay, 
Dr. Blay's application was sponsored by Dr. Patience Soa. Both of, the, of these are unable to attend the conference and so that we'd just like to congratulate the winner of the award, Dr. Blay, and thank uh, Dr. Patience Soa for being the sponsor. Thank you. Now, please welcome Anne Marie, pa Anne Marie Palisar, who will announce the winner of the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award on behalf of the award committee. Oh, you John, oh, John you gonna do it? Please welcome John Strong. <clears throat> Good morning. The P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award is designed to honor, in P. David Pearson's name, the authors of an article, chapter, or book written at least five years prior to the nomination, which has positively and demonstrably influenced literacy practices and or policies within district, school, or classroom contexts. Before announcing the recipient of this year's award, I want to recognize and thank the members who joined me, John Strong, as the 2023 Award Committee. Dorian Harrison, Joaquin Munoz, Maria Selena Protasio, Laura Teichert, Jennifer Turner, Tanya Wright, and co-chairs Miranda Fitzgerald and Anne-Marie Palansar. At the heart of the article that is being honored this year is the commitment of its authors to improve the writing skills of Latinx students who have for too long lagged behind their white peers on measures of writing as assessed by the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Given that writing is a gatekeeper for college admission and a threshold skill for hiring and promotion for salaried workers, failure to close achievement gaps in academic writing have serious social and economic consequences. The recipients of the 2023 P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award are Carol Booth Olson and her co-authors Tina Matuchniak, Wee Chang, Rachel Stumpf, and George Farkas who are being recognized for their article entitled Reducing Achievement Gaps in Academic Writing for Latinos and English Learners in Grades 7 through 12, which appeared in the January 2017 issue of the Journal of Educational Psychology. This article describes an intervention called the Pathway Project that demonstrated statistically significant effects on the academic writing of Latinx students and English learners in a rigorous randomized field trial in a large urban district. The Pathway Project takes a cognitive strategies approach to reading and writing instruction focusing on planning and goal setting, tapping prior knowledge, forming interpretations, monitoring, and reflecting and relating that research indicates experienced readers and writers used to construct meaning from and with texts. Teachers of mainstreamed English learners participated in sustained ongoing professional development and implemented intervention strategies over a two-year period to make the cognitive process of meaning construction from and with texts visible to teachers and, in turn, their students. Tanya Baker, the Director of National Programs for the National Writing Project, who nominated this article, points out that the work in this piece built upon over 20 years of research, produced a guide that has been downloaded by over 200,000 teachers, and has been featured in the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide for Teaching Secondary Students to Write Effectively. The P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award Committee is pleased to recognize this timely, important, and accessible scholarship. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Carol Booth Olson and her colleagues on this award. We want to thank the committee for this award and especially David Pearson. Um, it is such an honor to receive award, an award that bears David's name. We hold him in such incredibly high esteem. His work dealing with the reciprocal processes of reading and writing in the act of meaning construction and the role of strategy instruction has had such a profound influence on us 
And so um, it's, it, it warms our hearts to receive this honor. We want to acknowledge our two um, uh, co-authors who are not here, Rachel Stumpf and uh, George Farkas. But I just want to say uh, what an honor it is to work with Hui Chung and Tina Matukniak, um, now colleagues but former doctoral students. And we also just wanted to do a shout out to teachers and kids. So after we completed this study, we received two other grants from EIR. One was an expansion grant uh, to four California writing project sites. And the next was an, uh, another grant from EIR to go to seven different states through eight national writing projects. And it was during a very troubled time, politically, uh, social, emotionally, and in terms of public health, where everyone could have just thrown in the towel, but the teachers and kids rose to the occasion. They were empowered, they worked so hard, um, they had pride in themselves and their work, and so we thank all of them. Um, it is a time when we need to tell teachers how important they are. So thank you so much. You know, one of the charges of the conference planner is to identify uh, scholars to deliver the plenary address. And uh, that was an easy task for me. I knew who was at the top of that list. And there are times when you send emails with the hope of someone saying yes. And so I sent the email and stood by or just waited by. And when Dr. Donna Ford said yes, I said, we are in very, very uh, good shape. So it is my supreme pleasure to see you here today, uh, Dr. Ford. To this end, I invite Cindy Brock, who will introduce this morning's invited keynote plenary speaker. It's an honor to get to introduce Dr. Ford to our, to our LRA community. Dr. Ford is a distinguished professor of education and human ecology in the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. She's also an affiliate faculty member with the Kerwin Institute and the Center for Latin American Studies. Professor Ford is in the Department of Education Studies and Special Ed. Professor Ford conducts research in gifted education and culturally responsive, multicultural, urban education. Specifically, her work focuses on the achievement gap, recruiting and retraining culturally different students in gifted education, multicultural curriculum, and instruction, and culturally competent teacher training and development, African American identity, and African American family involvement. Professor Ford has written over 300 articles and book chapters. She's made over 2,000 presentations at professional conferences, organizations, and in school, and in school districts. She's won many, many awards. Just two of her awards just this year include the Plenarian Award for Gifted Scholarship and the 2023 EduScholar Public Influence Award. Dr. Ford is a creator of the Ford Female Achievement Model of Excellence, FAME, and when I asked Dr. Ford, what would you like the LRA audience to know about you? She said that she's a proud mother and grandmother. And her, her son is Kyle, and her grandson is KJ. Dr. Ford, we extend a warm welcome to you. Warm welcome to you. Thank you. My goodness, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that um, I've been invited um, to give this talk, and I hope that you don't look at it as a drive-by presentation. And by that, I mean that we can continue to have this dialogue discussion with um, a focus on what the issues are, as well as 
um, some recommendations, okay? So I want to warn you that I'm one of those individuals who over prepares. So I believe I have 68 slides in here. So I'm going to um, probably go over a little bit, but I hope you'll stay here, okay? All right, thank you for coming. So um, I titled this Beyond Lip Service, Decolonizing Children's Literature for Real, which means um, racial pride, equity, achievement, and liberation. Um, this is my personal website, so some of the things that I'll be talking about, um, uh, resources that I'll be talking about, they will, they are um, on my website. Not all of my publications, but some other rec uh, resources, okay? So drdonawaford.com. Um, all right. Um, so you've read the abstract, and let me just say this. Um, we're going to focus on real, like I said, and we're going to talk about rigorous and responsive multicultural literature, as well as, you know, what it means for all of us. I'm not just saying you, I'm saying us. What it entails to be anti-racist, um, equitable, and culturally competent. And I'm so proud to say at, at The Ohio State University, um, I teach a class called Anti-Racist, Culturally Responsive Education. Teach it every semester, including the summer. And I'm not one who just complains about what the issues are. I also believe that recommendations and resources should be shared. Um, but one thing that I forgot to put in here as a slide, in case I don't mention it um, in the appropriate um, place, is I, um, I want you to um, get to know about Culturegrams, culturegrams.com, uh, quintessential with KW. I, you know, go ahead and spell it. It's not Q I, okay, but K W. And then, um, yeah, let me just say, oh, on your mobile um, devices, you can get some um, apps, all right? So I hope I'll remember to say that at the appropriate place. So, apps on culture. All right, so meeting the needs of gifted um, black students, my entire career, meaning I got my doctoral degree in 1991, has been devoted to unapologetically complain, invent, and kvetch about the underrepresentation of black and Hispanic and low SES students in gifted and talented education, as well as advanced placement. So I write about what are the academic needs of students, what are the cognitive, what are the social, what are psychological, et cetera. So through one lens, it is multicultural, all right, education. What are we doing to address those that's in the center right there? And then through another lens, it is gifted and talented education which we have an uh, organization called the National Association for Gifted Children. I call it the National Association for Damn Gifted Caucasians. Pisses me off after all these years that I'm still saying the same damn thing since 1991. Thank you. Thank you. So by the way, I meant to say um, I'm not um, bipolar, but you're going to hear from Dr. Ford and Donna from Cleveland. So I do curse, get ready. Okay, so having said this, and by the way, let me thank Dr. Tatum for um, the recommendations. Um, it's just, I'm, I was speechless to get it. Thank you so much. All right, so gifted and talented education as well as advanced placement. And I just wanna say, advanced placement is not solely designed for gifted students, it's for any damn student who shows an interest. So we need to open those doors. All right, we need to consider gender, and we need to consider not just income, but social economic status, which is much broader. And if there are questions later, I'm happy to um, explain that more. And um, so what I want to argue is that deficit thinking is a major problem um, in every um, discipline. Um, you want to talk about the pandemic, racism is a pandemic. Racism is a pandemic. So deficit, deficit thinking is in every discipline, unfortunately. But for this purposes here, we're talking about how it um, shows up in terms of low expectations or no expectations and negative expectations, stereotypes, and these you know inflexible prejudgments about populations, inflexible thinking. Um, we're talking about racism. And yes, I am not um, afraid but to use that big R word, racism. There's not gonna be an elephant in the room in my session. All right, I'm calling it out. Thank you. 
and um, we need to consider under referrals. Okay, so that's under referrals to gifted and talented education as well as advanced placement. And then over referrals to special education, those high incidence areas. So I hope you know what those areas are. And um, if not, you know, I'm happy to talk about those. Not low incidences like visual impairment, hearing impairment, physical impairment. There's nothing subjective about that. This is when subjectivity and tests are involved. So, for example, um, you know, labeling our black boys as hyperactive. No, they're not hyperactive. They're not ADHD. They are vervistic. And I have a slide that talks about that. Verb, verbistic. So deficit thinking. The less you know about others, the more you make up. The less we know about others, the more we make up. And that must change. And yes, that's in every facet of education, and that includes literacy. So deficit thinking. Um, I cannot do a session without talking about culture because, you know, we, we want educators to be culturally responsive, anti-racist. And then I say, well, what is your definition of culture? And they don't have one. So culture is the accumulation of beliefs, values, attitudes, habits, customs, and traditions shared by a group of people. These belief values and so on serve as a frame of reference, a, vi a lens through which we view and respond to, you name it, all right? And then um, it says that, you know, or respond to the world. So this is why I will see a black male walking down the street and, or in a classroom. Let's just you, you be, you be in the classroom. And I see the teacher, he's raising his hand, and I see the teacher ignoring uh, him. Um, when I look at that, you know, others are like, well, I just didn't see him. I'm not going to use this word, but BS. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Stop this invisible mess. Okay, you didn't see him. So when I talk to teachers, they have one perspective, and then I have another. And we listen to the minoritized students, and we're usually on the same page, me and minoritized uh, students. So we are blinded too often by deficit thinking, by um, not just color blindness. I prefer to say culture blindness which I really don't think is a thing, but you know, it's, it's out there. You see culture. There, and I don't believe that much in implicit bias. I believe in explicit bias. You know what the hell you were doing. You know what you were saying. So not just implicit, we need to talk about explicit biases. So I love these iceberg analogies. So what we need to do, too often we have um, educators focusing on what is above the surface. Important, but superficial. So we, they focus on, you know, the language, the uh, slash literature, the dress, the food, um, other things that you see up there. And those seem superficial, but when you ask, well, why do you dress that way? Why do you eat that particular food or not eat that particular food? Why do you um, like that genre of literature, et cetera? Then we take that beneath the surface, and it is just so much under there. So above the surface, important, but we need to find ways to go beneath the surface. So since educators, and I've taught at University of Kentucky, I've taught at University of Virginia, The Ohio State University, Vanderbilt, and back at The Ohio State University. And I'm there to stay, by the way. Um, I love our black dean, all right? He's unapologetically equity-minded. Okay, so what we have are, um, is taking place is that cultures are clashing. And, and that's in beliefs, values, attitudes, habits, and not just customs and traditions. That goes back to the less you know, the more you make up. So here is what we want to do. We want dynamic thinking. And that is the more we know about others, the less we make up. The more we know about others, the less we make up. And that scale um, is, well, there's two of them there, but that one of those, and particularly the one that's balanced, is what I mean when we talk about equity. All right, so I just said, you know, talked about the importance of culture. What do we know about gifted students and culture? What do we know about literature and culture? What do we know about you fill in the blank and then culture? And my favorite, favorite model of understanding black culture in particular is A. Wade Boykin's model. And I promise you, it has implications 
for literature slash literacy, okay? So it goes with, stop saying knowledge, skills, dispositions. It, it would be dispositions, knowledge, and skills, because if your attitude is not right, you're not gonna get those knowledge and that dis, and the, um, skills, okay? So it is not, just, not knowledge, but it's dispositions, then knowledge, and then skills. Please keep that in mind, and I've written about that for diverse issues in higher education. All right, so when you could get those culture grams, there are over 200 culture grams. And my students, my son who does travel internationally, and others, when they tell me that they're going like on spring break or anywhere to another, or even on vacation to another um, nation, a country, excuse me, I say, well, you know, where are you going? And they tell me, and I give them these culture grams, which are often made by the embassy of that country, so that when you go there, when you go there, you would not be culturally assaultive. And when you go there, you would not experience cultural shock, okay, as much. So, um, and, and I, but I'm not traveling outside the U U.S. I have not traveled and don't plan on traveling outside the U.S. There's a hell of a lot going on here. Why do I want to go to another country and experience that BS, all right? So I'm staying my black behind here. I didn't use that word. I wanted to. Okay, but anyway, I'm staying here. All right, so, but there's no culture ground for someone like me who is a person of um, African-American descent, a, a person of um, enslaved people, all right? So pe people can get these culture grams, and they know, you know, if you're going to Abu Dhabi, if you're going to Portugal, if you're going to China, if you're going to North Korea, I mean, you, Russia, if you're going to Israel, you name it, there's these culture grams, all right? So I give things to my students. And then they're like, well, what about for black people, you know, who are descendants of slaves in the U.S.? and we don't have one. A. Wade Boykin is your source. So we got the things above, all right, which I'm not minimizing. But you know, what about spirituality? Black people, research says, are the most spiritual of any population, the most forgiving of any population. Um, let me just keep that moving. You know, affect, very emotional, love strongly, hate strongly, and that also includes re responding in strong ways to the literature that we're asking them to uh, partake in, all right? Movement, again, and verve, we're not hyperactive, we're very demonstrative, and we are very, very uh, movement-oriented. So don't call us ADHD, use movement and vervistic. And by the way, I'm, I'm rushing going through this, I apologize. Um, we need to also focus on expressive individualism, which I use, um, I use the word creativity, so, for example, um, I put a lot of energy into this right here. I put a lot of energy into what this shirt is going to, you know, this, this blouse. I put a lot of energy into these fingernails and toenails. Y'all can look at the toenails later, okay? And this, you know, this uh, watch, all right, this um, Apple Watch, et cetera. And if I'm in your class and you don't notice that, then there is no sense of belonging, so we are very, very creative. And the research indicates that children who live in poverty and then blacks overall are the most creative of every population. So why, what are you gonna do? Are you not gonna use creative writing or are you gonna add more creative writing to what you do? We will excel at that. Um, there's um, oral tradition. We love to speak, we love to talk. And in particular, black girls get into a lot of trouble like myself because we are blunt and direct. We tell it like it is. So I remember this um, student of mine going to work with some black students in an after school program. And she came back and she said, I cannot tell you what just happened to me. I'm like, what happened? She said, well, I had on this skirt and it was kind of tight and the blouse was kind of tight. And I went to lunch and over eight. And then when I was working with the girls, they had said, you know, Miss such and such, you have a booty do. And she's like, well, what's that? Your stomach stick out more than your booty do, okay? <laughs> you know, but in a classroom, you get, you'd be sent to the office. And by the way, she said it was true, okay? <laughs> All right. Oh, let me, I just got to say this. One time, because we're talking about literacy. So one time I was reading with some second graders. It was when I was in Columbus. I was reading with some second graders. And it was the d time when I was like a size four. I really was, okay? And I love little mini skirts and leather skirts and um, fishnet stockings. 
Okay, so I'm reading to the children, and um, before I knew any better, I said, tell me what questions you have. And this little girl said, you got on fishnet stockings. I'm like, oh, yeah, you like them? She said, well, that's what prostitutes wear. I'm like, let's move it on. <laughs> Shit, let's keep on going. All right, but others would have suspended that little girl. And at that time, that is what was happening. All right, let me move on. Social time perspective. I'm stressing right now because I'm trying to be monochronic. Go by this time that says you have one hour and a half. Polychron I mean, monochronic, but polychronic is, let's pretend like we're in a black church. Hell, we'll finish when we finish. <laughs> Okay. We got to look at Gordon Alport, degrees of prejudice. You cannot um, implement culturally responsive um, literature and uh, have a, you know, this, this uh, goal for literacy if you, again, are deficit oriented. So, Gordon Alport's five degrees of prejudice. Please study that. Antilocution happens every day. Uh, and I'm, I'm skipping the description because of the time. Avoidance, this is where you don't want to be around us. Most people call it white flight, but it's, it's more than that. You don't want your children to go to school with uh, those who live in poverty. You don't want your children to go to school with black children, whatever. So you put them in private school, parochial school, and by the way, uh, you pay for your children to get into gifted and talented education. Y'all heard what I said. All right. <laughs> so you bribe your way so your children can get in those programs just so your, ch your child won't be around people who look like me. So avoid us. But what if I want my child to go to that gifted program, gifted and talented program? When you deny us because you got policies and procedures in place to deny that, that's when we're into discrimination. Then we can talk about, I mean, then you have to look at the fourth one is, um, it says physical attack. We see that every day, especially with police profiling. And then the last one is extermination. There's so much, we could spend much more time on this, I'm sorry, but I hope that you will you know, take a picture of this and remember these degrees of prejudice. And I want you to reflect on where you are with say black students, black girls, black boys, Hispanic, girls, Hispanic boys. By the way, which Hispanic or Latinx? Is it Mexican? Because that's the one that's the most despised in this, these United States. Is it Puerto Rican? Be clear on where you are and get, get rid of that deficit thinking. All right. I love Merton's typology. All right. This is where you're thinking, which is prejudice, and then you look at your actions, which is discrimination. So one is called um, all weather uh, bigot. I'm sorry, I want to start with, yeah, all weather. Hold on, I can't see that. Anyway, <laughs> let's look at the first one. And it is where you're not prejudiced and you don't discriminate. All weather liberal. I'm sorry, don't discriminate. That's the goal. The third one is, the, uh, the fourth one, I'm sorry, is where you are prejudiced and you do discriminate in that corner over there. Then there's you are prejudiced, but you can't discriminate because you got someone like myself or Dr. Tate or others who's like, no, I'm Tate, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen, all right, or Office for Civil Rights, Department of Justice. And then it will be one where you're not prejudiced, but you do discriminate, and this is where you acquiesce into the status quo and more, all right? So Merton's model, you might be saying again, why is she sharing those? Because I'm saying we have to reflect. We got to look in the mirror. And we have to see where we are and where we need to go in order to truly make sure that um, we are um, effective in terms of literature and literacy. All right, so multicultural literature. Um, I have to say this, um, and something you wrote not too long ago, Dr. Tatum, it was so inspirational. It had me and my, one of my doctoral students thinking about not just being illiterate, but also being illiterate. And illiterate is you cannot read, for example, but you want to. Illiterate is you can read, but you don't. There needs to be more research and discussion, not just on illiteracy, but a literacy, or you might say a literacy. It's hard to find work on that. So let me give you an example. So the first time I was could afford um, to fly, fly a, a plane, fly on a plane, my son was maybe eight years of age, and I packed him all of these books. I'm thinking this is a long trip. He's gonna read this. He's gonna read that, etc. 
And um, so I, I took out the first book when we were sitting on the plane, and he's like, I don't want to read that. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you're going to read this. And he kept saying, I don't want to read this. He said, I want to read this book. And it was a book about cars, automotive. And I'm like, what in the hell are you going to learn from this book? He said, do you know what um, a carburetor is? I'm like, no. He said, that's what I learned. Do you know how to change a tire? I'm like, no. That's what He gave me all these examples. So I just shut the hell up and said, "Good, keep on reading. Keep on reading. And he, when he could read what he wanted to, he was not illiterate. He was not illiterate. He was literate. So I hope that example uh, helps you. So when we impose on children, you're going to read this without thinking about their interests, their passion, then we are contributing to not just illiteracy, but illiteracy. All right. forgot that was there. Okay. So now we go to, you know, meeting the needs of gifted students, bridging these gaps. I already mentioned that. So let's go to multicultural literature as well as um, um, literacy in general. So we got to keep thinking about how do I bring culture into this work. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. But it says, in a multicultural curriculum, there are few stimuli with greater potential to move people to action than literature, because literature tells the stories of human events and the human condition and not simply the facts. Literature does more than change minds. It changes people's hearts. And people with changed hearts are people who can move the world. Remember what this organization is about. Thank you. All right. Um, showing you something you are probably already familiar with, but the paucity of multicultural literature. Hell, we got more literature on animals than we do on damn people. That is trying to be culture blind, culturally assaultive to curricular violence. So this is from 2019 to 22, all right, and it gives uh, um, some data on increases in multicultural literature, but we are not there yet. We are not there yet. 22, we're just talking about last year. Okay, so moving forward, we're talking about racial pride. I just want y'all to keep thinking about this Venn diagram. We have all this, since COVID, um, we had COVID-19, we have all this literature on social and emotional learning. But you know what? It's culture slash colorblind. I read it, I'm like, that has not a damn thing to do that's going to help black children. That's not going to help Hispanic children. That's not going to help. You fill in the blank. I'm like, I'm so sick of this. And that's why, as the introduction said, I have so many publications. I'm almost at 400 now. I just have not updated my website. All right? Because I got a hell of a lot to complain about. <laughs> All right. So I've written a lot on not just social and emotional learning, but racial identity. Okay, so let me add, so take a picture of this, please, because I cannot go into every theory. 1054. Okay, I cannot go into every theory, all right? So this is where you find all models of racial and ethnic identity. So the first one, very practical. The second one, just full of research, full of research, okay? So how many of you have heard of Negressin's theory, Cross's model of racial identity? Show of hands. Okay, I see Dr. Tatum. All right, well, I'm glad I'm presenting this briefly. So you must learn about racial pride. And in um, this talk right now, I just want to focus on one, which is black racial identity or negressence theory. And negressence means the psychology of becoming black. All right, so pre-encounter. There are three identity types there. But the main thing is that there's very little regard for being a person of color. So assimilation, um, you know, I'm not black American, I'm just, a bl I'm just an American, okay? And then there's um, self-hatred, all right? So you, you don't want to be identified and you, you, you can even go to plastic surgery so that you are not looking like you are um, a black or a minoritized person. But this is mainly to blacks. And then there are stereotypes. So sometimes teachers will ask me, 
you know what? I I see black teachers. They seem really hard on black children. That's a whole. That's a long discussion. But when I when I get to know those teachers, I'm looking for whether they don't want to be identified as black. You know, like Clarence Thomas. I want his ass reading to my kids or anything else to do with black people. And yes, I said it. I said it. Self damn hatred, and it's in his biography. Okay, so I'm looking at minoritized teachers also, like, where are they? Then you have these, um, um, uh, what do you call them, um, encounters, encounters. So, you know, um, stereotype, I'm sorry, um, r racism, discrimination, all right, and more. All right, so it's your wake-up call, and then it's, you move into what's called immersion, immersion. And this is where I think about Malcolm X at the height of black rage, okay, Malcolm X. You see Malcolm X in the literature more than you see Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, reverse that, <laughs> reverse that. You see Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the curriculum more than you see Malcolm X, height of black rage. And then if there's support, and that includes multicultural literature, which I want to share, then you move into internalization, which, you know, you're all pro-black. You're about blacks and Hispanics, or blacks and children who live in poverty, and a multiculturalist, which I can uh, consider myself, which, you know, I'm venting about every ism, every ism, all right? So, how many, uh, well, you don't have to do a show of hands. One book I, I highly recommend that you get is called Grandpa is Everything Black Bad. Is Everything Black Bad. I have, have been counting the number of times on the news, you know, what, so let's say with politics, when something negative happens, people are like, it was a dark day. That person had a dark spirit. I'm sorry, you know, things like that. Why are people calling me when I'm talking? Okay, so... <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Okay, I apologize. All right, so um, just no, think about your language, right? Think about what black or dark means in your culture compared to light. Grandpa is everything black bad. And our children are, are um, facing this question uh, on a damn daily basis, all right? So please get that. So going back to these, you know, real, we're, I'm talking about racial and ethnic pride, and I just mentioned the negressions theory. So I have um, a unit of more than 50 children's books for preschool to get grade two or three, and in there I have all the color books I could find. So one of my favorites is my box of color, and I use it also to promote creativity. But it says, if I made the sun this color, will it still be just as hot? And then there's a peacock in there. Let me back up. There's a peacock in there that they change to different colors, like, like black and gray. And it says, if the peacock were this color, would it still be just as proud? But this one says, what if I were not the color that I was meant to be? Would you still like me? Would you be my friend? Our children are not just asking that for their peers. They're asking that of you, of you as professionals. That goes back to that deficit versus dynamic thinking. All right, so you could be looking at this like, now, nah, how would I use both of those two books in my class? I, you know, higher ed or in P to 12? I hope you're thinking about that. So uh, on my website, I'm being mindful of time, on my website, um, I have hundreds of books that are um, related to each stage of racial identity. So I'm, I'm, I have a master's in counseling, so I also focus on bibliotherapy or cinema therapy, okay? Somebody's doing something. Which I, what are you saying? Say it again. Oh, go back, okay. All right, that right there, okay. But it's still, it's on the same website where the other, um, uh, whatever that thing is, QR code is. All right, so stages and phases of racial identity. All right, so bibliotherapy, so the P means preschool and you see the rest. And no, I'm not saying you have to be a counselor to, be, to do bibliotherapy. As literacy and literature professionals, you should know the power of 
of literature, not just multicultural, but literature, period. So I focus a lot on that. So for example, here's Encounter. This, the books in this section focus on various encounters and the characters' reactions to those. So one of them is um, like the Black Snowman or I Hate English, all right, and more. Then we have these encounters. And my favorite book in my of every book in the world is Mazin at Blue Hill because that was my life, my life. And I had all these encounters in a private school. They got me so messed up that I hated being black, I hated being poor, I hated being uh, smart and trigger alert. I wanted to kill myself after being in a private school in the 10th grade and my mother had to take me out of that school and I'm a very strong person. All right. So what woke me up and helped, even as a high school student, was reading this elementary level book, Mazin at Blue Hill, The Power of Literature, which promotes literacy. Okay, pre-encounter and immersion. So there's some descriptions. All right. And then internalization, which is where I am now. And there is no amount of racism vicariously or um, directly that will take me back to previous stages, okay, of racial um, identity um, using um, Cross's model. So internalization, all right, and then internalization. So please, I hope that you will take a look at those books, and um, if there's more recent ones, I've just not had a chance to uh, modify them, but they'll get you started. So this gets to literature, I'm sorry, literacy, and it avoids illiteracy and illiteracy. So this is the most recent book that I've written, Black Boys Are Lit. And yes, Dr. Tatum, um, it was inspired by your work as well. Um, in it, you know, I talk about, I mean, there may be 30, I can't remember, but 30, 40 books. And we break it down using a model that I'm going to share in a few minutes. Okay. All right, so equity. Um, this is a short one. So equity, we're talking about you know, liberation. All right, take down the barriers, including your mindset as a professional. Deficit thinking. Achievement. Um, I want to mention the achievement gap, which I call an achievement trap. Achievement trap, and we got overrepresentation and underrepresentation, as well as problems with discipline. All right. So um, they are, this is very hard to overcome this in order to achieve. I really like Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs. And when, you know, so meeting those basic needs at home and at school. Also, the green one, which talks about esteem. I replace that with racial and ethnic identity, not just self concept, not just self esteem, racial and ethnic identity identity and when that when you get to that stage in your life then you can move to what's called self-actualized all right so i'm um, keeping it going real liberation all right liberation so equity was one where the barriers were taken down this one just is where we empower children to take down barriers or to cope with barriers, all right, to manage barriers as best they can given their circumstances. So it's not just about you and what you're doing, it's about what are you doing, even with literature, to empower children. And that goes back to those books that were listed earlier. So um, about a week ago in um, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, uh, my colleague uh, Cynthia Tyson and I wrote a piece on decolonizing um, literature in education. We focus some on P to 12 as well as higher education. So all you got to do is put our name there. All right. So anyway, um, I'm not sure if you um, know what we mean by decolonize, but it says it requires the conceptualization of de I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong sentence. Anyway, this approach encourages a holistic perspective that acknowledges and respects the unique qualities of every individual. And then it goes into more of the framework, and it says decolonizing literature would first require a commitment to the conceptualization of decolonization, followed by the intentional action to 
make changes unapologetically make changes in the spirit of not just being an ally, not just being an accomplice, but also being a co-conspirator. Please read that literature on the difference between those three. And what we need are co-conspirators. And that means for um, non-minoritized people in here, um, using your white privilege for good. Okay, so counterbalance. This is um, I'm sure nothing new. So we were these in this piece we talked about the importance of de I'm sorry of counterbalance. All right, we focused on characteristics of high quality literature. So what terminology? And I just alluded to this earlier um, when you are using black and dark in a negative way. And by the way, um, on um, MSNBC. Um, 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, 2015 in Nashville, um, I had a meeting with Dr. Um, or Reverend Al Sharpton, and I can't wait to get on that show. That took place really recently. We were planning for me to be there. But also, when I look, listen to Simone and Sharpton and others, they too will say it was dark. Stop using that damn word to re refer to something negative, especially people, people. A lot of the good things happen in the dark, all right? Please stop using that. And that includes Halloween and other kinds of damn things, all right? Stop. So dark and black are associated with something negative. Visualizations. Our children, we're watching. And the nonverbal messages mean a lot. The characters. How are they positioned? As well as, when you look at this, what are the characteristics of individuals in the literature that you have adopted? I mean, do the pictures even look authentic? I remember a long time ago, well, I'm going to skip that one, but it was about children. Let me brief, abbreviate it. Children were taking a standardized test in the state of Illinois. They did not like some of the pictures that were uh, illustrated, and they refused to take the test. The test had to be um, t thrown out and redone. So we are watching. Those visuals mean something. The settings, you know about that. But do we always put minoritized people in um, urban areas or in low-income areas or what you want to call in inner city areas, et cetera? OK, relevance. This goes back to illiteracy. Did you choose this book, this piece of literature, because you find it interesting or because the children do? They find it interesting. And you know what? If you have a book that you know, is in the canon, air quotes, you have got to find a way to interrogate it through a culturally responsive lens. Otherwise, it is curricular violence. How many damn times? I went to Hathaway Brown in um, 1976, and we had to read The Scarlet Letter. Why the hell kids still reading The Scarlet Letter? In 2023, the canon just has not changed, and it does little for minoritized populations, but it empowers your white students. So we need rigor, not rigor mortis. I got to say, let that sink in. And so the model that I use is... Um, let me put over here. I, I, I haven't found anything much better than Bloom's Taxonomy. I'm not going to insult you by going over Bloom's Taxonomy, but please get a Bloom's Will and start using it in your um, work to see are we at the highest two levels, <clears throat> excuse me, which would be evaluation and synthesis. So I'm almost to the end, you guys. Thank you for staying. When we look at uh, multicultural education, I want you to replace also education with literature. What we have currently is the most common at the bottom, and that is called contributions level. So this is where we focus on food, fun, fashion, folklore. We dehumanize minoritized individuals by not focusing on their personalities and their characteristics, but focusing on things. So we got to have a Black History Month celebration. You know, Donna, you know, in, in uh, air quotes, parentheses, you're black. Can you bring in some fried chicken? Hell no. 
Can you bring in some chitlin? Hell no. Can you bring, what? And then Hispanic, can you bring in some tacos? What in the world are you doing for all the children in your class with that BS? It is 2023 and this shit is still happening. I'm angry and you know what? If you're not angry, something wrong with your ass. You need to be angry about what is going on in our schools. And literature is part of the problem. <laughs> Whew. Food, fun, fashion, folklore. That's up there in that iceberg at the top. Additive, temporary, safe, unidimensional, or polemic. All right? And this is where, oh, like Black History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month, Women's History Month, okay? Those are not, there, there's not much rigor in there. You are afraid to challenge your children, or guess what? You don't know how to. So what we need to do is get beyond contributions and additive and get the transformation. The curriculum is transformed. There is um, more than one perspective. There's different perspectives. So for example, some people think those are the same. I'm listening to student A and student B and that's her opinion, that's his opinion. But then I know that student C and student D have very different opinions. That's what we talk about when we say opposing perspectives. All right. I mean, just look at how history is portrayed in um, American books versus um, those you see in other uh, cultures, all right? I'm, okay, let me move forward. Transformation, okay, curriculum. And by the way, I'm sorry, go back to contributions. If children had stereotypes, you reinforced it. If they had no stereotypes, you gave them stereotypes, all right? And additive is not just Black History Month, Hispanic Heritage, it's like... All right, do you want Dr. Ford to present or Donna from Cleveland? Do you want Malcolm X or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? And I believe in the pedagogy of discomfort. No pain, no gain. Racism is not easy to experience, and neither is learning how to be non-racist. You've got to experience some discomfort, and it's worth it, not just for your children, but for you as well. Thank you. So transformation. And then the pinnacle, the ultimate, is social action or social justice. Children are, are empowered. They are empowered to know about, um, to, 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 to take on injustices. They are empowered. They don't just think about what should be done. They take actions. All right, and then same with you in the curriculum. This is not what we're just doing with curriculum. What are you doing if you're a professor in terms of how you're looking at literature or multicultural or education, literature or education? Are you at contributions? Are you at additive? Are you at transformation? Are you at social action? There is no other model of how to infuse multicultural content into the curriculum than this model here. So I know it's hard to see, right? The least common is social action. So I know that's hard to see, so hold on. What we want is contributions to be the less common and the most common to be um, transformation social action. So the, you know, that's just larger pictures for you, all right? Larger pictures, same thing. All right, so here are those key words for you. Please take a picture of this. Please memorize this. Let's start with contributions. The 4F, food, fun, fashion, folklore. We dehumanize populations. I've had read literature where teachers, I mean read curriculum where teachers have told um, students to come dressed as Africans and they said we mean animals from Africa. Food, fun, fashion, folklore. Okay. Additive, safe, appendage, temporary, polemic. And there are books out there where, you know, like Amazing Grace, teachers will focus on girls can do anything I want to. They want to. They can play Peter Pan. But then the little girl is told, because you're black, you cannot. Teachers will ignore that. So if you can address, address racism, why, I mean, if you can address sexism, why can you not address racism? Or poverty. Whatever else is there. Polemic is you're going to focus on what you're comfortable with. But what, think about what you are teaching your children. And then the last one, again, transformation. Multiple views, opposing views, empathy. How would you feel if you were? How do you think she felt? How do you think they felt? 
empathy. And there's a lack of empathy in these United States. Huh. Woo! A lack. All right. And then all subjects. I have books on multicultural gem, physical education, multicultural um, geometry, multicultural algebra, um, algebra across cultures, uh, multi, you know, ethno-mathematics, multicultural math. You know, a lot of us are into STEM, which we need to be, but we also need to be in the other areas as well. So w th there's no excuse. Any and every lesson that you, um, let's say, implement can have a multicultural focus in a rigorous way, not rigor mortis. Okay. This is the last, these are the last few slides. And I know I've gone really fast. Okay, trying to be monochronic, not polychronic. Because like I said, if it was, if I could have my way, hell, y'all be here for at least another half an hour. All right, I'm not going to do that. That's polychronic. It's called Color People's Time, CPT. Some of y'all heard of it right on. Okay, so... I created years ago this matrix called the Bloom Banks Matrix. I took Bloom's taxonomy. I don't know if that shows up. Oh, here we go. So I took Bloom's taxonomy, all right, the six levels. And you see that's color code. The first three, the lowest one are color coded red because it's dangerous. And this is, you know, really should be green. I'm sorry. But anyway, I'm green, okay, because we've, uh, it's better. Then here's lowest level on banks, and then the highest level on banks. So what you end up with, see that in red, is dangerous, dangerous, is rigor mortis, rigor mortis. There is no, and, and it is um, culturally assaultive, curricular violence. So it's maybe a place to st start in some areas, like when you're doing introductory materials, including, you know, literature book, literature. Um, it's the beginning, but you cannot stop there. Then we look at, ooh, went too fast. Then we look at, let's say, the, the yellow area. And I call that gifted education. We in damn gifted education talking about, you know, uh, analysis, evaluation, and synthesis. And it's about food, fun, fashion, and damn folklore. Miseducation. Miseducation. Okay. Then in the blue, we have, it is high on banks, and, but, not and, but low on blooms. And I see this too often at my multicultural conferences that I go to. Not everyone, but I, I see is a problem. Mm, let me skip some examples. But here's where everybody needs to go. It's a damn green. When, when. You have bloomed it and you have banked it. And that back boys, our lit book, did ju has done just that as well as other books that I've written all right and we have one coming out for girls which I was meeting one of my colleagues former doc student she's at the University of West Georgia and we're putting the final touches on the book for girls okay so that's just blown up for you to see the lowest of all 24 cells is knowing contributions students are taught and know facts about food fun fashion folklore you can get a little better oh no hold on all right, you get a little better over here, but it's still in the danger quadrant. So s applying, you know, application additive. Students are required to and can apply information learned about safe, temporary, unidimensional, all right, materials. Then we have the blue. We're getting there. It's warm. So you are, um, here it is. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking, uh, watching time. Did I go backwards? Hold on. Yeah, sorry. All right, so then here is this quadrant, which is three. Jeez. Okay, where it's an analysis, evaluating, creating. All right, so that is high on balloons, but low on banks. So if we take the highest one, creativity. Students are asked to and can create or synthesize important information about cultural concepts and themes. And since that's additive, in a safe way, in a polemic way, in a fill in the blank. Anyway, the green to go. Analysis, evaluation, creating. And I'm so glad the newest Bloom taxonomy put creating for, uh, as a more higher um, level. So there's a quote which says, 
you give a intellectually, which says evaluation, child or person, um, a task and they can complete it. A creatively gifted individual finds problems to be solved. And whenever I'm traveling and I think about bags on wheels, I'm like, thank you for whoever created that. Okay, and when I think about how much smaller the damn phones have become, and now I don't have to carry around a, a c camera and then a pager, and then you just keep, you, all this is all in this one little, you know, instrument, etc. So when you when you feel that people have changed their lives, it's a creative individuals and research by Passau. Uh, and Torres showed that the most creative of all populations are black children or those who live in poverty. So what are you doing to make sure that when you are uh, choosing your literature, implementing you know, literacy strategies, that you are making sure that it is culturally relevant, not culturally assaultive? So this is the last slide, and it says, take a blank uh, matrix. They're on my website. Take a blank matrix, and then one thing it says is right there, okay? So it says, take a previous lesson plan and put all your activities, questions, items in the cell, not just a quadrant, the cell that they belong. Is it, you know, for example, comprehension, um, transformation? Is it contributions, synthesis, or creativity? Put them where they belong. And then you, will, you can evaluate this. And you're like, you know what? I really don't have anything in quadrant four. That's where you're trying to go. By the way, not just for gifted and talented children. This is for all children, including those in special education. All children. All right? So you're not taking and like, oh, I got to do something new. No, you take what you have. All right? But then, and you can have more than one item in each cell, more than one item in each cell. Your literature does not have to be multicultural, but you make it multicultural by getting into quadrant uh, four. All right? And then, um, anyway, you can see the rest right there. Okay? So with that said, having rushed like hell, um, I'm, I'm ready. I'm done. So <laughs> thank you for attending this session. And thank you. You all are wonderful. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm applauding you for coming, okay? Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I got to come back. <laughs> thank you. So I, I'm serious. I hope you found some rigor and relevance in this, and you feel engaged and empowered to go back and make a difference, whatever your position is. Um, there's a quote which I grew up with that said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Y'all remember that? United Negro College Fund? I say a mind is a terrible thing to erase. Damn, let's do some work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was the first time. Oh, excuse me. I think that was the first time we had uh, two plenaries and one address. I think she said uh, Dr. Ford and Donna from Cleveland. <laughs> hey, we really appreciate it. Uh, your 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 remarks align with how we must continue to uh, interrogate hierarchies and. Uh, uh, I am deeply grateful uh, for your uh, presence. So thank you for joining the LRA uh, community. Um, for everyone who's here, I will see you later this afternoon at the business meeting at 445 uh, in this room. Enjoy your day at the conference. <clears throat> Thank you.